and clear of moment. Our Father in heaven, we just ask that you grace us with your Holy Spirit's presence as we open your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll take my glasses off just for a moment so I can see your faces. After that, I'll have to put them on so I can see what I'm talking about. But I'll show you a little book. Anybody seen this book, Basic Christianity? Oh, that's interesting. It's all fresh then. I bought this book, I don't know, years ago. I read it, getting on for 40 years ago, and quite a few sections in it are underlined quite heavily. I must have thought they're important. And I picked the book up again recently, having a look at it. I read it right through, and I found things that I'd underlined that obviously didn't strike home with me back then when I read it the first time, but reading it again, I did. They did. And I found it very positive, very uplifting, and very reinforcing of what I already believed. Uh, the writer of this book, John Stott, is writing it from the point of view of people looking on at Christianity and trying to make the decision, is there something here for me or isn't there? And so it's a sort of an apologetic book, um, not apologising for Christianity, but substantiating what Christianity is about and that it is something that's worthwhile and something that a person would want to accept. And so I'm utilising some of his thoughts in here and I've added some of my words to it as well and I just hope you find it as as uh, enlightening and, and as beneficial as I did. I'll just open a page here because later on I, I want to read from it. What we're going to do this morning is um, have a look at some of the words and circumstances surrounding Jesus' resurrection. What I have to say may well change your point of view or the way that you view things that happened on that day. Not badly, for the better, I hope. And some of the things that I'll talk about uh, may well be different to what you've understood in the past. They're certainly different from what I've understood in the past. Um, yeah, but I don't think you'll find that offensive. But if you choose to disagree with me and John Stott, that's fine. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Usually we like to have a title to a sermon, particularly as you're putting your thoughts together. It, it helps to... Um, it just helps to assemble it the right way. And so I've entitled the, my talk this morning, The Power of God's Presence. And we all need God's presence with us and he can be a mighty power in our lives. The power of God's presence. And just to home in on where we're heading, I want to start by asking the question, what really happened in the tomb that Sunday morning? What really happened in the tomb? Unfortunately, none of us are that old that we could know with absolute certainty, but we're going to look at that question. What really happened in the tomb? Now, there, there are many Christians today, they call themselves Christians, um, but they're probably better titled Bible critics who say that D Jesus didn't rise again from the tomb. He didn't rise from death. He didn't come back to life, that he died uh, that, he, that he, he fainted, rather, and he was laid out on the cold slab there in the tomb, and that later on he revived. He got up, let himself out of the tomb. I don't know quite how he did that in his weakened state, and revealed himself to his disciples. Now, you can draw your own conclusions from that. It, it is quite ridiculous, but there are people who believe that. I believe that's because they don't want to accept him as their saviour. 
And they, they really made Jesus a liar because Jesus himself said that he would rise again on the third day. And in John, 8, uh, John 10 and verse 18, he said, No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. That's Jesus' statement. Any, any other belief that says that he didn't rise from the grave is making Jesus a liar. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 17 to 19, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. If, if we don't believe that Christ rose from the tomb, we might as well go home now. You're really wasting your time. You are yet in your sins, he says. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. There's no hope after that, no resurrection for the dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, it's quite a hopeless situation. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So we're going to have a look at what happened in the tomb and see if we can find something more there that will add to what we already know about that situation. We're going to have a look. You open your Bibles to John chapter 19 and verse 38 and we're going to read from there through to chapter 20 and verse 9. And this covers all the, uh, the burial of Jesus and his resurrection. We're starting from the point where Jesus has died and Joseph of Arimathea is approaching Pilate requesting the body of Jesus. Verse 38 of chapter 19. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, that's John, he never, he never puts his name there, whom Jesus loved and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, that's John, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooped down, and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw, and he believed. Now I'm not going to suggest for a moment that we really have to find more proof for the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. I believe that everybody here is well established on that point. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. In fact, I have a part of a letter here written by a lawyer. <coughs> he was writing to Reverend E. L. McCassey. There must have been some letters passing between them about, the, about Jesus' death and his resurrection. And the man writing this He's a lawyer, he's a sir, Sir Edward Clark, 
and his name is followed by KC, which would stand, I would say, for King's Council. Nowadays it would be QC, Queen's Council. And he says this, As a lawyer, I have made a prolonged study of the evidences for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is conclusive. And over and over again in the High Court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. Inference follows on evidence, and a truthful witness is always artless and disdains effect. The gospel evidence for the resurrection is of this class, and as a lawyer I accept it unreservedly as the testimony of truthful men to facts they were able to substantiate. That's pretty positive, isn't it? Pretty positive. Okay, let's just have a look at uh, the proofs for the resurrection of Jesus. The first one is there's no body. There's no body in the tomb. But the critics say, yeah, but remember John said that Mary Magdalene went back to the sepulchre when it was yet dark. She made a mistake. She arrived at the wrong tomb, looked inside, and saw there was no body there because nobody had been buried in that tomb yet. The only thing is, when they went back to the tomb, they went back with one purpose in mind. On the Friday evening, <coughs> Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, I think it was, had actually sat opposite the tomb while Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were preparing Christ's body before they interred him in the tomb. So they were well versed with where the where the tomb was. So it, it really doesn't hold water, that one, at all. Here's the one we've already mentioned that some people still believe in today, that he, he didn't die, he fainted. And he revived in the tomb with the coldness of the slab he was lying on, and that he left the tomb, went to, back to his disciples, revealed himself to them, it doesn't really hold water because he was in such a weakened state. The centurion told Pilate when Pilate questioned him, he was dead all right, and if anybody should know about death, it would be the centurion. He was probably there when one of his soldiers thrust the spear into Jesus' side and out flowed blood and water. So he could establish very definitely that Jesus was dead. Then there were those who said that the body was stolen. Somebody stole the body. But why steal a body and leave the gra grave clothes behind? There's quite a lot of trouble to get somebody ready to inter them in a tomb back in those days. And uh, who was going to seal the body, particularly under the noses of the guards, and unwrap all the, <laughs> the cloth off the body before you took it? It just doesn't make sense. There's another thought that the disciples stole the body. They then would still have to get past the guard. So that was most unlikely. But think of it. The basis of these men's message to the world was that Jesus had risen. <laughs> they accused the Jews of having crucified. You crucified him, but he's risen. And that was the whole basis of their message. So it's hardly likely that... Um, with their knowledge of the body that they've stolen, that they're going to be prepared to face whippings and beatings and prison and even death. It just doesn't make sense. The objection that, sta that holds the most amount of water is the, the objection that the Jews stole the body, or the Romans. They were both frightened of Jesus. The Jews were frightened of conversions from their faith to Christianity and the Romans wanted no trouble. So they're the most likely. But you think about it. If they wanted to deal a blow to the early Christian church, all they simply had to do was to show some remains of Jesus that they'd been holding. But there's no body. 
They didn't have it. There's no body. Another good piece of evidence for Jesus' resurrection from the tomb is that he was seen. He was seen on a number of occasions. That same day, John says, he revealed himself to the disciples as they were locked away in the upper room. He revealed himself to them. He had already revealed himself to Mary Magdalene and she had taken the story back to the disciples and they didn't believe her. And then you remember Thomas wasn't at that meeting so when they told him he didn't believe either so Jesus met with them again. Then he met with them two of the disciples on the way to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus. Then he met them at the seaside as well when they were fishing. And Paul says that he met with a group of 500 people as well. So Jesus was seen after he rose from the grave. One of the most striking pieces of evidence is the effect of Jesus' resurrection, his death and resurrection on the disciples. Look at them before Jesus' death and their response to Jesus being taken and crucified. They were frightened men. They hid themselves away for fear that the authorities would be after them next. And yet not many days later, we see them standing up and preaching Christ crucified and Christ risen. No fear there. That, I think, is the, is the best piece of evidence that there is. But there's a fourth piece of evidence, and that's the one I want to look at this morning. And that is that the grave clothes were not moved. This piece of evidence has always been there, but it would appear it's been clouded slightly by translation. And I want to have a look at that. If you were in that tomb on Sunday morning, what, from your knowledge of Jesus, what would you expect to see happen? Would Jesus stir yawn, stretch, swing his legs over the side of the slab and get up? What would you expect to see? I don't think you'd really expect to see it like that because, as we've already said, this isn't a resuscitation. It's a resurrection. Only a few hours later, we, find, we were to find Jesus in that room with the disciples. The door was locked. They secured the building so that, he, so that the authorities couldn't get to them. They were frightened men. Here we find Jesus in the same room with them. Would anything less have happened in the tomb? Paul says when he's writing about our resurrection at Christ's second coming, he says our transition from death to incorruptible takes place in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Would anything less have happened in the tomb? I believe Jesus' dead body was there one moment, then gone the next, in a flash, as his glorious body burst forth from the tomb. Let's have another look over John's and Peter's shoulders as they peered into the tomb. Looking at verses 3 to 8 of chapter 20. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, John, and they came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre and he stooped down and he stooping down and looking in as supplied, though his words aren't there, and he stooping down saw the linen cloths lying Yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeing the linen cloths lie and the napkin that was about his head, 
not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. What was it about the, the linen clothes that caused John to write so much detail for, about them for a start off? But why did he say he saw and he believed? It could simply mean what we said before. Somebody stole the body, unwrapped the bandages and left them there and took the body. Why would he say what he said? He saw and because of what he saw, he believed. Let's go back in the story a little bit and see if we can find out what it was that he was seeing. You remember Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he took the body of Jesus and Nicodemus came along too with a hundred pound weight of a mixture of myrrh and aloes ready to prepare the body for interment in the tomb. They wrapped the body with these bandages or pieces of cloth. And then they interlaced those layers with the myrrh and aloes mixture. That's how it was. That was the custom of the Jews, as John said to interior body. And then they, they wrapped his head also. But when the Jews did that, they always left the face clear and the neck also, which you'll see is quite significant. If you have a look at John chapter 11 and verse 44, you'll find that that's how, how uh, Lazarus was prepared for burial as well. 11 and verse 44. This is Lazarus coming forth from the tomb. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. That was the custom of the Jews. The body was wrapped, interlaced with the myrrh and the aloes, the spices, and the head was wrapped separately, leaving a gap for the neck and the face bare. They then laid the body out on the stone slab that was probably hewn out of the back wall of the tomb and they rolled the stone across because the Sabbath was nigh. So what would we have seen if we'd been inside that tomb on Sunday morning? John Stott's words are, are better than mine. I could tell you, I've read it so many times, I could tell it to you, but I'll give you his words. What then should we have seen had we been there? We should suddenly have noticed that the body had disappeared. It's gone. It would have vaporized, being transmuted into something new and different and wonderful. It would have passed through the grave, grave clothes as it was later to pass through closed doors, leaving the grave clothes untouched and almost undisturbed. Almost, that is, but not quite. The body clothes, under the weight of a hundred pounds of spices, once the support of the body had been removed, would have subsided or collapsed and would now be lying flat. A gap would have appeared between the body clothes and the head napkin, 
where his face and neck had been. And the napkin itself, because of the complicated crisscross pattern of bandages, might well have retained its concave shape, a crumpled turban with no head inside it. Now, a careful study of the text of St. John's narrative suggests that it is just these three characteristics of the discarded grave clothes which the beloved disciple saw when he looked into the tomb. First, he said he saw the cloths lying. This word is repeated twice in verses 5 and 6. But on this first occasion, it's placed in an emphatic position in a Greek sentence. So the text might be translated this way. He saw as they were lying or collapsed the linen cloths. Next, the head napkin was not with the, with the linen cloths, but in a place by itself. Not that it had been bundled up and tossed into a corner. It lay still on the stone slab, but was separated from the body cloths by a noticeable space. Thirdly, this same napkin was not lying, but the King James Version says, but wrapped together. The previous translator has actually translated that word, wrapped together, as twirled, as a better representation of what John saw. The authorised version wrapped together and the revised standard version rolled up are both unfortunate translations. The word twirled aptly describes the rounded shape which the empty napkin still preserved. It's not hard to imagine the sight which greeted the eyes of the wandering apostles as they first looked into and then went into the tomb. The stone slab, the collapsed grave cloths, the shell of the head cloth and the gap between the two. No wonder they saw and believed. A glance at these grave cloths, clothes, proved the reality and indicated the nature of the of the resurrection. They had been neither touched nor folded nor manipulated by any human being. They were like a discarded chrysalis from which the butterfly has emerged. He goes on a little further here and I won't read you too much more. They, that they were intended to be visible evidence for the resurrection is further suggested by the fact that according to John Mary Magdalene who had just returned back to the tomb after telling the disciples. When she stooped to look inside the tomb, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Presumably, this means that they sat on the stone slab with the grave clothes between them. Both Matthew and Mark add that one of them said, He is not here, for he is risen. Come and see the place where he lay. This reference to the place where Jesus had lain, emphasised by both the position and the words of the angels, confirms the suggestion that the lie of the clothes and the absence of the body were concurrent witnesses to his resurrection. So what really happened inside the tomb? I believe that the unmoved grave clothes tell us of the power of the presence of God. John looked at the grave clothes and he said he believed. I looked at the grave clothes in my study already believing in Christ's resurrection and I thought, wow, that's pretty fantastic evidence. And Paul, looking at the certainty of Christ's resurrection, wrote these assuring words. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. 
For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And Paul carries that theme on in the passage we all know so well in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verses 14 to 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this say we unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I'd invite you to stand and sing the hymn that we should have up on the screen in a moment, He Lives. I serve a risen Saviour. Do you serve a risen Saviour? Certainly. He's in this world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I want to thank you this morning for the salvation that is available to us through Jesus because of his death for us. And we thank you, Father, for the certainty of his resurrection and the hope that that gives us of, of glory and living with you forever. Father, we just pray for your presence with us, the power of your presence in our lives as we leave this place today. We pray in Jesus.